everybody I'd like to welcome you to my YouTube channel this is Steve coming back with another video um, so I have a few people asking me what's going on with the machine language project um, just to kind of mention this out loud that we are a project a team of people so we all have our own individual lives too so at the same time I like to try to get everybody together instead of making a video uh, last week I was tempted to try to make one on my own because I came through some pretty good breakthroughs um, so that's the kind of the point of this video tonight is show you um, kind of where I'm going and some of the things I'm doing to kind of move this thing forward. I'm going to try to finally open up what I've been wanting to do for a long time, which is get some Atari videos out. Now, I know there's probably not a good reason to do it. Maybe I'm wrong, but at the same time, I really want to make do this for a home time, full time living. That's my dream to just sit here one day and just go crazy over the comments or Commodore 64, go crazy over whatever, you know, because I've got probably about six or seven different channels out there. I've never mentioned that. You might may have seen them already. I've got one for blogging. I've got one for the Atari. I've even had one for .NET way back in the days. I have one for gaming, but I haven't really gone into that a lot. I, I did Minecraft for a while there. I'm strapped with doing the study of this scrolling and this bank switching has been killing me relentlessly and I've been talking to some people and just last night it, it I don't know what it was it was like suddenly it almost clicked like a light bulb I mean I remember I went to bed last night and I was just so happy that I had finally didn't have to ask somebody about something I finally began to understand something deeper that I didn't understand before which we're going over tonight which is the, the mysteriousness of bank switching so, for those who already know about it, might be saying, well, whatever, but, you know, everybody, we, we kind of all grow on our own levels and just kind of where we are. But at the same time, for me, it was a real, and I felt a really sense of joy. And I think this may be why people like enjoy challenges, because I've always been kind of person to try to do a lot of research and try to figure out what other people do, but never really tried to figure it out for myself. But when I finally started figuring it out, I got this amazing joy. I got this, wow, it was like a thrust, you know, like a rush. It was like... Wow, I did that. <laughs> but in, anyways, it was really cool. So we'll look at this started right now. Okay, so we're back here. And first what I wanted to do was show you the struggles I've been having. You guys already know that I've been using this uh, Codebase 64 map scroller, implemented it to work in CBM PRG Studio. I want to show you some of the things and some of the bumps and curves or whatever you want to call them. That I had to go over to try to understand what was going on. Now, this is what I was struggling with all week. I mean, this is where my sprite was. My sprite was not loading in correctly. And even worse, if you look at this map, this one was not doing any back buffering. Look how bad this looks. You can see it scrolling. And you can kind of see it flashing here as it's scrolling because it's not it's not accurately switching the screens. Because when you want to get a fine scroll, you want to make sure it's able to switch from the main screen and switch to what's called a back buffer. And that's the whole purpose of why I found this program and I liked it is I wanted to be able to see how to switch to the back buffer. But then, of course, my sprites were all screwed up. And I'm like, um, finally, somebody was able to help me fix that. And then after I got the sprite implemented, all of a sudden, as I started scrolling, I don't have an example to show you here, and I started moving around, I noticed that the, scr the sprite was turning on and off. So you would see the man like this, and all of a sudden, it would be a little box, man, box, box. I'm like, what is going on? And... And then much later, as I started talking to him, he started telling me, well, what you're doing is um, you're switching between screens and the sprite is not initializing. So I tried to understand that more. And then as I started talking to this guy more, he's somebody I've met on Limit 64. Um, Ozzy Fathom, if you guys, if I said that right, if you haven't uh, met him, he's a really cool guy. He's done a lot of cool stuff. He started helping me to understand it. He said something very important. He says, don't just go at something and just, you know, start writing code. Make sure you really understand where you're going. Make sure you understand what's happening inside. And that's when it kicked me. And I was like, you know what? I've done this too long. I've been too lazy. I've been the kind of guy who just likes to go in here and just like write a few lines of code and see if it works. He says, I don't want to do this anymore. I mean, if I do, excuse me. But at the same time, I feel now it's got to change. Now, to kind of give you a background on this, um, I attended a university way back in the 90s. Um, when it was actually, um, there was courses taken at that time where you could take up programming courses. So the major I was seeking at that time was actually a programmer. And I remember one of the, he was the first or second classes I got to take at the University of Akron was actually a class on uh, logic design or something. I think it had a strange name. But the whole idea behind this class was to learn how to write flowcharts and really understand if you can get the computer 
I mean, see how the computer is thinking. You can have you can have that much more success in getting your stuff to work right. And I remember the class wasn't too hard. I got through and I started doing the diagrams and I got through the flowcharts. But I realized as I started using that going forward in a lot of my other projects and stuff, I went through the university. It became much more easier. But I also noticed when I turned away from it, it would become that much more difficult, and I wouldn't. I'd kind of be going in circles, or what they call spinning your wheels. So I don't want to spin my wheels anymore. You're just going to be like in gravel or whatever, snow, and you're stuck. You're not going anywhere. So at the same time, what I've been doing lately on the side here, and I'll switch over and show you um, the transition to where it's taking me. We'll go back on that here in just a minute. I'll show you the flowchart stuff I've been working on. It's not all the way done because I have a lot of things I still need to go back and tweak, and I also need to finish the mapping one, which is the most massive of the flowcharts I've ever designed. So anyways, I'm going to switch over to the other screen. Now I'm going to minimize this one because I got the original running here in the background and show you the results. And I'm very pleased, although the animation is not working yet, but you'll see the sprite is now looking good. And it is no longer flashing. I mean, it looks really, really good. And it took me the longest time to really understand why, why couldn't I get this to work? When I move my sprite around, he's flashing. Because when you're using a bank one, what you're doing is you're switching to a different, you're basically shifting memory around, so to speak. You're not working in the same screen memory. You're not working in 0, 0400 or 1024, which is the common screens. Rather, I believe it's it's up 2K, if I'm not mistaken there. You're, you're moving ahead, and everything moves forward, not just the screen. The character ROM, what's called the character generator ROM set, that moves forward, which is the graphics you see. Also, the sprite pointers move ahead. So it couldn't kick me, and I was like, what's wrong? So I used the original implementation of our program, which was designed by Siggy and, you know, Endurian code or whatever. And... I noticed as I implemented that code, as soon as I implemented that map the first time, the sprite was flashing on and off. I'm like, what the heck is going on with this? And then as I started digging more and more into it, and I spent a lot of time in the scrolling code, guys, because I really, really want to get this working. I really want to see uh, the cool scrolling game. Uh, but anyways, enough aside of that, I began to finally understand that I had to, I had to reset the pointers as I'm switching the buffer. So as, you, as soon as you switch the buffer, you need to shift where those new pointers are. If you shift back, then you need to shift back. So I don't know if we're going to use an LSR and an ASL or whether that will work or not. I'll check into that later. Essentially, you're just moving those bits around in memory. Um, excuse me if I'm getting over your head. I could show you some of the code, what's really going on. But the whole idea is once you understand that, you can easily go in and start creating really fine movements. And also, you by using Bank 1, of course, if you guys don't know it you have access to way more memory so it kind of opens up the bigger span of memory instead of having these limited spaces and spans or whatever of memory limitations i like to call them so i'll get back and i'll show you that and also don't let me forget to show you the flow chart so i think i'm going to stick that off here to the side i'll sneak it up here on the screen and i'll show it to you before we close here i guess but i spent a lot of time on that flow chart but we're going to go into the code here just a little bit now <clears throat> so I can show you what's going on, what I've been talking about here. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to, you know, enlarge this a little bit here. Some people say they can't really see the screen for this time. So it did default right here to the map already. So we're going to enlarge it again. Okay, so I enlarged it as big as it can go. It can't go any more of that. Well, actually, it looks like you can. So you can really zoom it in there you're just holding down the control key and using the middle mouse to zoom guys i'm gonna leave it like that for now yeah it's good enough to see these are all the routines i use these work directly with our editor code our spelunk.asm because we're switching from that code over to the map because as soon as we switch to the map we want to make sure we're able to move this right around so i set this code up to show as he's moving left right and up and down if he falls it's supposed to scroll the map up and down left and right not all the way working, but that's kind of what I was doing with that. So let me just um, move out of here a little bit. So I'm going to show you. These are the hidden screens right here. I know I talked about these briefly in the Code 64 um, example I showed, but essentially what you got going on here is you got pointers that are running inside of your screen memory. Now, what is the screen mem? I can show you. Um, if I zoom out again, I'm going to lose it here. So I'll just tell you what it's doing is it's pointing to another screen in memory that is where the store the screen is being stored so 
your screen memory is not going to be at the same place if you're using bank zero and just go to c64 i think i just typed in bank one i think that's what i did earlier when i was looking up the sprites thing it should be right down here so we're looking for code base 64 right there it is boom i got it so you can get it up here so right here, this is the Vic Banks and what I was just talking about. You can see the memory here, Bank, Z Bank Zero. This is going to start from zero to 3FF as I was telling you about. Bank One, which is the one we're using, starts at 4,000 hex to 7FFF. And then Bank Two and Bank Three, but these are just used for different things. So I don't want to use these. These are for like bitmaps and I forget this one's for something else. But the whole idea behind it is once you shift it, you'll notice that these numbers are changing. See how this goes from 4, 8, and it's up to C? So they're basically moving memory around. And it talks all about this as an example here. Great, great example to go by. I'm sure a lot of people in Limit 64 use this. But it talks about where your character memory is and how it is inside of, you know, as you're, you're shifting through it here. You can see 0, 0, 0, 800, 1,000, 1,800. And the same thing with screen memory. We saw R starts at the zero, and then it goes to 400, 800. Um, and then it talks about the sprites. Uh, the sprites, you know, start. You take the screen memory and you add it to the, the the sprite pointers to figure out where they're at. And once I did that, once I was able to figure out where the sprites were pointing to, I just shifted them as I went from one screen to the next. I would set one to like the screen memory plus zero three F eight. And then when I shifted it, I would set it to the next one, I like screen memory uh, plus whatever it was, 0, 4, 7, F8 or whatever it was, to make sure, you can see right here, 4,000 plus the 40 hex, to make sure that I understood where the bank was switching it. And I know I don't always do the best explanation, so excuse me on that. But this is a great resource if you want to kind of go and dig into it yourself. But that's what you're basically doing is you're shifting around that memory as long as you know where those new memory where that character set, the generator, the character generator ROM and the screen memory and the sprites, then you're good to go every way. But you have to remember to switch them back and forth, which is what I want to finally show you now in here. So I'm just going to, this is the main screen right here. This is kind of what initializes all the screen memory, but I'm going to show you. I'm just going to go in here and just going to look up the, um, the VIC memory control. Let's type it in. And this will get me right where I want. I can actually erase this old code that I don't need anymore. This is all the crazy stuff I was doing playing around with it. Getting back again to that stuff about not having a flowchart, you're just basically just constantly tweaking code and until it works. And a lot of I know there are people out there who like to do that, but for me, I really, really want to get something that works and I want to understand it. I just don't want to sit there and keep playing with it, playing with it. You feel like you're spinning your wheels. So I'm just gonna stay stay with this on now. Stay with me on it now. So, and I just skipped a section here. Let me go back here one second here. So back here, where was I? Um, get right back there again. I forgot to click the screen. That was my fault. So click the screen and kind of reset it there. Right here, this is where you're going to set the, the screen, whatever you call that, D018 for the character. I just like to look up the proper name for it. It's actually the VIC-2 chip memory control register. This is where your computer sees its memory. It sees the screens. It says here you can see the character sets. This is um, the key to making sure that your screens are showing properly. So what you do is you set this to 241 and you notice over here, this is showing the proper bits that are lit. It's using the high nibbles here because these high nibbles, if I'm saying that right, excuse me, these high um, digits or whatever bits here, these are the ones that are controlling the screen, and this is going to tell you what it's pointing to. Um, these ones down here, you just have to look up in the book, whoops, and they'll show you what they're doing. But that's how you basically use the in, which the longest time I didn't understand that. But you're basically trying to see which bits are we going to use, and then which bits are we going to keep. That's what OR does. So this OR down here, too, 2 is representing bank 1. You see it says set it at bank 1, because if you look in the... Um, and I'll switch over to the camera here just for a minute. Just show you what I'm talking about. If you look over in this book, I hate doing it like this way. This is like the old-fashioned way of doing things. But look real carefully there. You see the banks right there? I showed them to you earlier. Hopefully it, it comes in. See the banks right there? Pay very t good attention. These are the banks. And if you look right beside it, you see the digits here. The 00, the 01, 10, and the 11. 
that's what this is doing. If you look over here, you'll see the one zero, which represents bank one. That's how you get it to set to bank one. That's kind of the initialization um, for the first part. The second part, what I was talking about, was making sure that those screens work. So this is a switching out. I believe this would be the, um, this is my back buffer screen. So this one is pointing to this. Remember again, we're looking at these, um, these bits here. The 1111, I'm just going to read those off to you right quick here in the book. Um, I can't go around fast enough in this book trying to page through it. It actually says the bits, and if you count these, they start at zero, by the way, if you remember watching my machine language tutorial video, they start at zero, one, two, three. So it's using bits zero through three, although the zero is unused. But the book says that bits one to three are the text character dot data base address within Vic2 address space. And to give a little bit more example, it's just kind of where the character shapes are defined in the character generated ROM. So this is key to everything. You have to switch these so that it understands where your screens are. Now my problem, what I was doing is I was keeping all of these identical. And this is what Ozzy Fadim called me out on. He's like, you know, you're keeping all the screens the same, but at the same time, when you're switching, the computer's not going to see that. It's going to, because you're switching memory screens, you need to tell it where the new data is. Where are the pointers, sprite pointers now? They're not in the same area. If you bank switch and, and you um, you change screen memory, which this is what this register is doing right here. This is actually 648 is um, what I learned about. It basically points to the screen that you want to display from the back buffer and you want to swipe it back out and forth. It's called the top page of screen memory. And just reading through the map in Commerce 64, it tells you basically, it's telling you where the screen, Commerce 64 can be moved to start on any 1K boundary. Um, this is done by manipulating the VIC-2 memory control register, as we mentioned, at 53272 or the D018. Hence, hence the VIC memory control, that's the zero, D018. And that's just going to tell you where the screen is pointing to. And the reason why we're doing that is because, like I said, when we're switching the screen, um, if you're not, if you're, if you're in bank and you're trying to just leave it on one screen, you're going to get choppy uh, scrolling effects and it doesn't look really good. This is why you have to swap the screen back out. This is just how the computer is able to make it look and work right. So anyways, I wanted to show you that. So if we go down here, remember this one is uh, 111 and then a 1000. You could also convert these if you want to. Um, you just basically you just use the regular calculations. If you want to see it over here, I'll show it to you. It's 128, 64, 32. Uh, what is it? 16, 8, That's right. And you just count the numbers here. There's four right there. Or is that five? Wait, I, was, so I got one too many here. Maybe I added one or something in my angst there. So that looks right. So you take the first four. Here's so you got 8 plus 4. 8, 9, 9, 10, 11, 12. That's 12 plus 2. 13, 14 plus 1, that's 15. That's 15. So basically it's looking at and it's setting this to the and number 15. So if you had to translate it, it would just be like and number 15. Remember you can also, um, as I showed in the machine language tutorial, you can also, what are you doing to me here? Go back here for a second. Oh, I just scrolled the screen down there. You can also use the calculator, which I thought I had it up here, but I guess I didn't. Gonna pull it up here real quick. And you can um, just use F5 to kind of get it back to hex, or F6, you can go to decimal. F8, you can go to binary, just by pressing the keys there. You can use that, just set it to binary. I just like to set it to binary like that for F8. And just type in the numbers you see on the screen there, the 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. And you just hit F, um, that's for the, the hexadecimal. We hit F6, and something went wrong here, let me see. <clears throat> Okay, so I actually ended up stopping the video by accident by pressing an F key there. But anyways, if you're using a calculator, you can, I'm not going to press it now, so I'll end up shutting it off again. But you can use the F5 for hex, F6 for decimal, and F8 for binary. Or you can just click the little radio buttons, which will do that to be safe. So I'm going to add one more one to this. Actually, erased it. So that we match what's over here in our, our AND mask. And remember, it's just these, these binary digits being turned on. That's essentially all you're doing there. And if we go to um, and click the thing this time, instead of, you can see it's 15, just like I calculated earlier. So 8 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1 is 15. 
And the same thing for this one, you just find out where it starts at. So it's one, two, three, four, fifth one, one, two, three, four, fifth one. So this one should be 16. And we can just go back on here again if you want to see it. One, two, three, one, two, three, four. And that should be, oops, I did that wrong. I actually set that to decimal. I meant to do binary. Let's do it again. So zero, 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 one, one, two, one, two. And then you switch to decimal and you can see that that's 16 or for hex it would be 10. So essentially that's what you're doing is you're setting this to 16 so that you can get this bit. Now when you're ORing it, you're basically looking and seeing um, this digit compared to this digit after you you've, after you've end it with this and see what the value is and then you're gonna see what the results will be or what bits can we set so what bit is that it's one two three four five that's bit six was it one one two three four oh it's bit five and so going back to the book and a map in the Commodore 64 so bit five falls into bits four the seven and actually let me just go here Well, I don't know exactly what that one bit's doing, but that whole line of bits there is basically controlling the, it says 1000 byte area memory contains, it contains the screen codes for the text characters that are displayed on the screen. So once again, it's taking care of that, um, the screen memory that's showing up on the screen and everything. So, so basically that's kind of like the back buffer there so now we're going to go down to the next one here this is the back buffer you can see those are the same now another this one you have all zeros hi huh, it's not interesting but you still have the same binary i mean sorry um binary digits or the, the bits turned on over here but you notice there's nothing down here so when you're basically ending one to the other here well we have remember we're going to be ending that uh, value that's an accumulator there first as a result and then we're going to be passing that down onto the screen there so what we're going to do is we're going to basically take the zero or the one and the zero if we had to do it we would basically take one and zero and if there's a one and a zero if there's not if it doesn't have two ones set in it it's going to be a zero so it's basically zeroing out all of these ones here and just setting the result so it's going to be defaulting directly to the first screen part of memory in bank one I didn't understand that. I was trying all kinds of different things, and like I said, Ozzy Fathom has really helped me a lot to understand it. When I finally understood that's what I needed to do, I was able to get the screen scrolling work. After he showed it to me, the guy's a genius. After he, after we did that, we got the fine scrolling work, in which you saw me earlier. I'll throw it back up on the screen since I had a video kicked out on me here. Uh, was it this one? I think it was this one right here, yeah. You can see it's really... It's fine, you know, the screen, it's that you don't see the flashes in here anymore. It just looks really, really good, you know. It's not jerky or anything because it's running inside of an interrupt. And then later we'll change all the character data, and that's kind of another scenario to ta tackle. But you can see it's working really well. So now we're going to get down to how did I do that. I did a kind of a, a quick implementation here for the sprites. What I did is I created this one here. You see it says update player animation frames underscore buff. I'll probably have to close this again because if I switch here, it's probably going to crash again. I heard in my voice, and I know I need more of that in my videos. I know that's a huge thing on YouTube is emotion, evicting people's attention, and that's all done by your voice inflection. I work in a call center, so I really understand inflection is key to everything. If you have like a monotone voice, nobody's going to really pay attention or take you seriously, but if you have that upbeat voice, that's that's kind of what works, you know. But anyways, getting back to this, um, we'll just go back here. Excuse me if I don't zoom in the screen just for this part, just so I can go back and show you where I got that from right here. I, I just I copied the other one and I just kind of created a quick cheat, a quick one. But later we'll go back and we'll modify this after I get at the very end here. I'll show you my um, flowchart working. So right in here, this is the one I created because it's switching to the back part, so I just added the underscore buff at the end here. And what is key to this is right down here. Do you see the sprite buff plus one? This is actually not pointing to the old one, but it's pointing to the new pointers after 
we had switched over from one screen to the next because remember as we're doing that screen swapping we're moving memory around that way so we're moving the everything's getting shifted I don't know if it's the book talks about it um, and going back to the website here I think it says it moves up by was it 2k or 1k or whatever it talks about it in here if you want to read that here uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me see here. I didn't have a chance to look at this real quick, but it, it talks about it right here. Screen dimensions uh, telling you where you want to display your screen data. This is rounded 1024 equals 0400, and it tells it on each multiple bytes of 400 bytes of memory, and it shows where it's being added. But at the top here, I think it might be up here, so, that, so it can address 16K banks. So it's basically what's being seen by your screen. So excuse me if I don't have the direct answer on that. The whole idea is really understanding how and where the screen memory is moving to. As long as you always know where it is, you can get that correct back buffer to show. Even if you grabbed one way down here or something, you know, and had, as long as you're swapping between these two, like I say, for example, if I'm swapping between this one, and I think I'm actually swapping between this one currently, as long as you're going back and forth like that, I'm just showing you as an example here, you're getting that, that scrolling to work real properly because that's what's required on the Commodore 64. I guess it works faster for the cycles or something. Um, that's a later study. But anyways, that's what I did here is I swapped out this one. So you saw this one, a sprite buff plus one. But at the same time, the reason why I have to rewrite this is this is in here twice. You'll see update uh, sprite direction underscore buff. And up above this, I have the same thing except, where's that? Uh, let's didn't erase it here. Let's see animation frames, update sprite direction. I think this is it right here. So right here we have sprite zero underscore pointer, but this is pointing to our original pointers. So you have to switch those pointers to get the sprite to display correctly. And of course, once we do that, as you saw, you the sprite stays on the screen, and he doesn't move off the screen. Now the data itself was me not understanding that the sprite data where it starts at. I was just trying to. Um, and again, this is getting back to not really understanding something. I was just trying to go down here and I was playing with these values to see if I could get it to load in. And then once I hit 5,000 milliseconds, it was perfect. And I was like, why is it that I couldn't get to work at 4,800 and all this other stuff, playing with it, until I went here and I saw that the sprites actually ended up starting. I saw it in here somewhere. I know I did. I had to do a quick search so I don't have to sit there and struggle where I saw it because I saw it in here somewhere maybe I maybe it was another screen maybe it was a wiki or some I saw it on here somewhere where it said 5,000 was the 5,000 hex is the start it's actually the start of the next um the screen memory for your um well, that should be this one right here I think it is no that's the screen memory for, for the sprites I'm sorry it, well this is it so screen memory plus the sprite pointer it just tells where where they properly start at so it was 5,000. Must have not been this one. Must have been another page or something. But I saw it anyways, and I said, "Oh, now I understand why it only worked at 5,000." Because if you change this to like 5,002, it's not going to look right because the sprite data is going to be shifted. Remember, as it's drawn the sprite, it's drawn them in three sections of threes there each time. So it's drawn in one set, two set, and three set side by side there. So as soon as you shift it, messes up the sprite because the sprite is not actually an eight by eight. But it's 24 by 21 so but anyways hopefully that made some sense there I don't make this much longer um, we'll go more into this about the machine language project as we come across it but now I finally want to show you what I've been working really hard on Let's pause for a second okay so it's not done but here you see it I've actually flow charted almost the entire thing now some of this stuff is kind of um, a high level I haven't really gone in and done it you know, very particular. I've done some of the stuff like the animation frames, but let's talk about a little bit about flowcharts in case you guys aren't familiar. Why they're really effective, I think, is because you can see everything visually. You don't have to sit there and go in your code and scroll and say, okay, why isn't this working? I have to test these bits. I have to go ahead and check my flags or something and not understand why. If you flowchart it, you can see it and you can actually see what's going on with your program and you can watch the logic. It's really, really effective. So the way this works is these are kind of like, um, I guess you call them the headers. They have another name. I can't remember the old name, but it's like the headers. So it's basically where are the titles. I think they called them back in the days. The title of that routine starts at. Now this isn't display text isn't the title for this one, 
But if there were, we would start it out. This is just the beginning of this program, so it doesn't really need a title for this one. But these are the titles here. The orange ones I put, those are the titles. Now, these right here, these are just general, general data. So I just put in here a display text because this is what this area is doing is displaying text on the screen. This is setting up the sprites, so it's very high level. Down here, these are what they're called, the, the subroutines, I think they're called. Um, excuse me if I don't remember the original name, but um, anyways, these are the like the JSRs or the jump subroutines. So this one's going to our scroller as we're after we set up the sprite, and you see that this one after it goes to the scroller is going to the wait frame. So it's basically setting up the the ticking for the you know the, the timers and all that. And here's the timers being updated. You can see the joystick, then the move player sprite, and he's got display info. This is the order that they had them in here. So as you go through each of these, you can see what's going on instead of having to sit there once again going through CBM PRG Studio and you know just doing one of those relentless, uh, you know, just nightmarish scrolling things like this and say, okay, where was that at again? I'll just go through it, uh, just scroll down. You know, it saves so much more time if you can see it real time. Now it takes a lot of work to do this. Don't kid me. I mean. If you look at this alone, this is only one page. And look at this one alone. I've got some things down here, and I'll show you why in a minute. But there's all these tabs down here. These are all the different files for this. I've got almost all of them in here now, except the only one I don't have working or on here yet. I think. Let me see. Okay, I didn't go to the beginning actually. Need to. Let me just enlarge this because I can't get them from here. So we got this one, the core routines collision. The sprite routines, screen memory routines, the raster, here we are, screen routines. Um, then we got joystick routines, the play field, and the VIX setup. And I think there's more. I mean, these little arrows over. Yep, there's more here. You can see there's more. Then there's, um, this is the last one, the Splunk map. This one is taken forever to do because I'm doing this real time. I'm doing this the way it would originally be done, which is going out and writing the code. And writing out the definitions and writing out the complete logic for this the conditions and everything which I want to go back to that just to show you real quick here you can use a little arrows here in Excel to kind of push them over I think Excel in my opinion is one of the best ways to really flowchart because it's just so much easier you can actually add nice colors in it you can move it around copy it I, I was working with another one here and it wasn't so great and I, I downloaded one one of them was trying to sell me a membership but I found out Excel worked best for this, and I think it, most people might have Excel, it would probably work out. But anyways, like I said, these are the headers, these are the data. Um, these are, the, this, is the, this is what's called the flow here. So what I do is, I, as soon as I'm ready to do a condition, which is a true or false, you can set true or false in either direction, doesn't matter. I'm using true over to this side to keep it consistent. So in this way, um, this is another routine, so you saw me messing with this one earlier. Really, matter of fact, this is the one that we added for the back buffer, except this is the one just before we added the one for the back buffer. This is the update player animation frame, which allows our sprite to animate, which I still need to work on because it's not working yet. But once I get this logic working, I'm sure we're going to be able to figure it out. But it's the animation frame so that you can see the sprite graphic, you know, animating sprite moving around. So what it does in the logic here is first checks the timer. And then it does a mask here with those two bits. And once again, remember those two bits. It's just checking that bit zero and bit one of whatever this timer re register is. So you have to look at that. And then it's saying if it's true, then we're going to go to this one, which is, um, I think this was uh, branch equal. Yeah, I, did, I didn't even put it in here, but this is a branch equal. Equal is for equal. Otherwise, you'll see greater or less than for not equal. And it goes here to the animation frame. And then I just kind of put some high level here, increase animation. Uh, frames for sprite one and two later I'm going to write this all out so I understand exactly what's going on but it's just a high level for now you can always go back and you know add to it later but this is the first page and then we've got the core routines you can kind of see it again the same logic we're looking at the raster line are we at raster line f8 and if we are then we're going to go to wait frame and then wait frame is going back here in the loop so basically it's just cycling until we get that first raster line determined and then we get the next raster line. He's some reason using the same raster line. I forget why he did that, but that's what's going on. And you can see the clear screen down here. Again, kind of an, uh, high over, uh, a high overview until I decide I want to write it out. Clears the screen using the chosen character. Read joystick. Tells you about the values. So again, and I'll put this up on GitHub when it's complete. It has 
everything in this this code and I want to try to stay consistent do it this way for the project so we can really move this ahead in the right direction so here's the ones for the sprites and then I kind of put these little little question box whatever you want to say it kind of a, I think they call it info boxes or whatever to really tell what's going on with this part to kind of give like a little tip or whatever and then here's the one I wrote out this one to kind of show where the screen memory is I'd use NISTA because I always forget where these are stored when I want to look them up but these are the, the screen positions to show how it's going to plot and as we're drawing that scrolling we're just scrolling down through it you know and that's what this one is doing it's um, the weight frame subroutine and then we've got the clear screen subroutine I just left this pretty it's pretty basic it clears the screen display text is going to display text and I showed the parameters in here again these are kind of high overview or high high level the rasters are also high level because we don't really need to do anything with them just understand what they're doing um, then we got the screen routines again high level but you can see I got the params in here so we know what to do with the params when we need to use them then we got the joystick routines and once again high level but it, enough to be understood and then we got the play field high level again but the params so we know how to change it as we draw the play field and the play field is kind of the background <clears throat> then we got um, one here for our console debugging console and like I said this is the, the biggest oh, oh wait I'm sorry this is the getting ahead of myself this is the one for the big setup so this is the one that initializes our bank which you saw me talking about earlier to initialize and set it to bank one hence the one zero bank one and then I'm just going to move this over again even though we went over these I just want to show you this is the one I really wanted to show you this is the one that's taken me forever to do this is the um, let me move this over a little bit here this is the one for the, the map and I'm not even halfway done with this thing yet this thing is taking forever but I'm actually writing it all out you can see I've got down here because I really 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 want to understand how this map works to a T I want to be able to sit there and go in hey if I want to make it so that our player walks so far over and all of a sudden the screen's going to shift over like an original Splunker where would I need to do that you know and as I'm looking at this code and I say okay as soon as we get here I notice that this is where the screen's kind of scrolling this direction okay as soon as we get so far here to these pixels now we need to set a subroutine to say okay he's reached far enough maybe we need to shift that screen over or we'll do something similar to that but for now you can see this is all the code and this is not high level this one's written low level so you can see everything here we're checking the sync and is it greater than one against this is the I'll put it over here this is the B and E whenever you see the greater or less than that's the B and E if you just see the equals it's going to just be branch equal BQ that's just the way I just determine it and this is just showing you what it's doing and you can see everything is high level so I got these are like the little comments here and these are little sections in code to tell what these little variables are doing some of this is still a bit high level but at least it tells me at least I can kind of look at it now and say okay what is this section doing this is getting map index area so this is drawing across the screen how far across the screen and then you can see fill top here these are the names of the labels right here on the side <clears throat> And over here, these are the ones that tell what the temp variables are doing. Well, this one got pushed off the screen for some reason. I don't know why it got pushed way off the screen. You can see it right there. I'll probably have to move it up here or something because you can sit there and go like this. I could sit up here and I could grab this little arrow and just kind of point it down like that so we know where it's going to because we don't have room for the labels and that. This is why I started doing it on this side. But anyways, you can see how much I've done so far. This is filling the right side of the screen. Draw left side, draw right side too. I think these might be the back buffers. A copy screen, I don't know what RD stands for, but down here, these are some of the comments. I started trying, I wanted to put the comments for each of the lines too, instead of trying to do it with the little bubbles and stuff. But I know sometimes they don't line up properly, so they don't look right. So I didn't try to do them all that way. If they're consistent in a row, I could usually get it to work. And you can see how many characters cross the line have we copied, how many lines down have we drawn. And you can see that this one, if just going back up here, is a copy screen read. Maybe RD's read. 
this is the main one when I think you first initialize it's going to go to the draw screen this one might be executed a lot if I'm not misunderstanding and you can just see it shows over here what the temp variables do like I said again it's better just going into your code and trying to scroll to that section and scroll down through the code and say okay what's going on but a high level overview is so much easier to see it it just takes a lot of work I mean this has taken me forever to get this stuff in here so this as far as I got right here but I'll keep working on that until it's done um, always determine now to push my efforts forward and at the top here we got the variables I just stuck them in here in case I need to refer to them so much better than going through the code Whew. A lot to talk about. I think I went an hour over. I don't know how long this was because the other video cut off. But I'm going to call it right there for the night. Um, yeah. So anyways, guys, I hope you guys enjoyed this video as much as I enjoyed bringing it to you. Um, so we talked about, you know, the different, what I began to understand about the Vic memory and understanding what my problem was, why my scrolling wasn't looking right. It was looking choppy because I wasn't using the back buffers. And then we also talked about the solution I found out after I talked to Ozzy Phantom once again, giving him credit for Limit 64, that I needed to make sure I was switching the screens out each time to the right buffers. And if I was switching the screens out, the scrolling was going to work. But I had to make sure I was switching on the right screens. Originally, I wasn't. And I was getting a lot of garbled messes. And maybe I'll show you those in future videos or hangouts or whatever. And then finally, we went through the code, and I showed you where I did this in the code, in the scroll map there, and I implemented in the animation for the JSR animation, sprite animation frames, or whatever it was, the player sprite animation frames, to show you where I implemented, and I inserted those inside of the map, so at the right points we're switching on the screens, we're switching on the animations appropriately for the pointers that are already showing in that area at that time. And then finally, we went over the flowchart, and I showed you what I've been working on really hard and trying to get all this code down and it's just there's some for a high level but I'm working on trying to get it all as low level as possible so it's a lot of work but I'm looking forward to it I'm really excited now I, I mean I can't even tell you how excited I am because it's gonna happen I just know it I, I believe it guys I just believe it's gonna happen we're gonna I didn't ever say it from the beginning but I'm gonna say it now we're gonna make a game and we're already on the path and I think it's going to be a pretty darn good game when we're done. Because we're going to really work hard. We're going to put our heads together. And we're going to we're gonna make this work. So everybody who's ever assisted in the project, given any ideas, you will all be given credits and a scrolling screen at the end. That's one of my goals for this. So thanks, guys, for watching. Um, also, just to add to what I talked about, um, if you're interested in Atari stuff, let me know. Because I'm going to keep it separate from this channel. I have an Atari channel. And I'll try to work on that to the side. I've learned so much about the Commodore 64, I could probably go on here and start writing a scrolling routine inside of the Atari, but I don't want to get too far-fetched. We'll kind of start that little low level, maybe basic and a few machine language routines, and then kind of work it up later. But all because I've really realized I can monetize more than one YouTube channel, and just really excited about moving forward, and just excited about the opportunities. I mean, YouTube, when you really know what you're doing, I mean, really understand, you really have to reach a vast audience, you can make a living off of this and you can really reach people and change people's lives for me it's all about gaming but i think people like i said it's my dream one day where you come on this channel i say okay we're going to build a game we're going to do it in a month and we're going to do another game the next month and then so on and then you just see these things rolling out that would just be so awesome so things like that are on the tip of my tongue and i would like to get those accomplished so i'm not going to make this much more rant because i know this is probably a long video but thanks, guys, so much. I appreciate everything. Uh, let's keep moving forward. The Machine Language Project, we're going to try to get that out. And we'll get the Machine Language tutorial videos going. And it's going to be wonderful. So thank you so much for watching. Please hit that like button and subscribe. Have a good day.